You've done it. You've dialed in your water profile for your latest beer. Your pH is nailed and you've balanced your sulfates and chlorides down to the last part per million. You've followed every rule in the book, but there's still something missing, isn't there? That last 1%, that final elusive characteristic that separates a good beer from a truly world-class one. It's that crispness, that perfect balance, the complexity and snappy finish you taste in the best commercial beers, but you just can't quite nail down in your own brewery. What if I told you there was a fourth hidden brewing water chemistry number that the world's best brewers use in their water profiles? A number that gives you the ultimate control over that crispness and unlocks a level of precision you didn't think was possible. And if you think it's pH, you couldn't be more wrong. In this episode of Quality Focus Pro Brewers, we're digging deep into a water profile number that not many brewers use and how you can quickly and cheaply dial in the flavor of your beer through sound brewing water chemistry. Let's get brewing. G'day brewers, my name is Hendo and I'm a pro brewer coach from the Rockstar Brewer Academy. I help home brewers and pro brewers from all over the world implement the quality systems they need to brew amazing world-class beer. So for years, I was right there with you. I was chasing that perfect, vibrant finish in my lagers and IPAs. Sometimes I'd get lucky and nail it, but other times the beer would just fall flat, tasting flabby or dull, even when my final beer pH was right on the money. The answer wasn't in the brewing textbooks or on the forums, but rather found deep in the American Society of Brewing Chemists Methods. The answer was a concept that food and beverage scientists, especially those in the wine world, have been using for decades, and it's called titratable acidity. This concept, this fourth number, is the key to mastering your beer's flavour, and today I'm going to pull back the curtain and show you exactly what it is, why it's different to pH, and how you can use it in your next water profile. A lot of brewers think if they just get their mash pH right that they're all set, but trust me, that's not even half the story. Hey, a quick one before we get into the science. I just checked the analytics the other day and it turns out that a bunch of you guys watch these videos regularly, but you aren't actually subscribed. Wild, right? So if that's you, could you just take two seconds just to scroll down and hit that subscribe button? It helps this show reach more brewers who care about beer quality as much as you do, and it means you'll never miss an episode when we drop a new brewing deep dive just like this one. All right. Let's get back into the chemistry. So let's get to the heart of it. As brewers, we've been trained to worship at the altar of pH. We buy an expensive pH meter, we calibrate them religiously, and we do a little happy dance whenever we hit our targets in the mash, knockout, and final beer. And don't get me wrong, pH is critical. It's essential for enzymes to function properly in the mash, for hot break, for yeast health, and for color stability. But when it comes to beer flavor, pH at its best is clumsy and often it can be a misleading indicator. And here's why. When your pH meter gives you a reading, what's it actually measuring? It's measuring the concentration of free unattached hydrogen ions floating around in your sample, otherwise known as hydronium, and it's written as H+. The key word here is free. The pH scale is logarithmic, meaning that a pH of 4 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 5. And after all, it's the measure of the potential of hydrogen, which is what the acronym PH stands for. But there's the million dollar question. Do you taste free hydrogen ions on your tongue? Nope, you taste acids. You taste lactic acid, phosphoric acid, malic acid, citric acid, the actual molecules. Beer is full of weak acids that don't fully let go of their hydrogen ions. And these are what's known as bound hydrogen ions. Your pH meter is completely blind to them, and it has no idea that they're there. Think of it like an iceberg. The pH reading is the tiny tip you can see. It tells you something is there, but it tells you nothing about the enormous mass of ice hiding beneath the surface. That hidden mass is the total amount of acid in your beer, and just like a real iceberg, it's the part that'll sink your ship if you ignore it. Have you ever had this happen? You're adding acid to your mash, trying to nudge the pH down. You add 20 mils and nothing happens to your pH. So you add another 20 mils and it barely moves. What you're seeing is the phenomenon known as buffering. Your word is actively fighting back. That's your first sign that there's a lot more going on under the hood than your pH meter is telling you. 
Relying on pH alone for flavour is like trying to navigate the North Atlantic by only looking at the tips of icebergs. You're basically flying blind. So what is this invisible force fighting your pH adjustments? It's a one-two punch of alkalinity and buffering capacity. If you've seen any of my other brewing water chemistry videos, we've touched on this, but today we're pulling that thread because this is where the pros really separate themselves from the amateurs. Alkalinity, in simple terms, is your wort's ability to resist a change in pH. It's the counterforce to your acid. Think of it like a sponge. When you add acid, the alkalinity soaks it up and neutralizes it, keeping the pH from moving. Only when that sponge is completely saturated that the pH can start to drop. So where does this buffering power come from? In brewing, it's mainly from the carbonate in your water and the phosphate from your malt. The star player is bicarbonate, the main source of alkalinity in most water sources. When you add acid, bicarbonate ions grab those free hydrogen ions and turn them into weak carbonic acid, stopping the pH from dropping. This is why a common home brewer trick, that's the one where you add chalk to raise the pH for a dark beer, usually fails, and why I don't ever use chalk in any of my dark beers. You see, on paper it makes sense, but in reality, chalk barely dissolves at mash pH. It just doesn't get into the solution to do its job. The pros know this and instead use tools like slaked lime or baking soda when they need to, and they do it very, very carefully. And then you've got phosphates from the malt itself, and this is where things get really interesting. All barley malt contains phosphate compounds that act as natural buffers. They resist changes in pH when you add an acid or an alkaline. But it's not all malts that have this same phosphate content. Darker, highly kiln malts lower mash pH, not because they buffer more, but because they're more acidic. They actively contribute acid to the mash. But on the flip side, non-barley malts such as wheat malt contain less phosphate than barley, which means there's less buffering power. So when you brew something like a Hefeweizen, for example, and you don't compensate your mash and your wort pH for that reduced phosphate content, the finished beer pH can drop too far, and that's why that Hefeweizen you brewed turned out unexpectedly sour. Understanding this isn't just academic, it's completely practical. It explains why copying a water profile from a book or from another brewer doesn't guarantee results. Two water sources could have exactly the same calcium and sulfate levels, but if one has higher alkalinity and the other has low alkalinity, they will behave totally differently in the mash. You have to understand this invisible force field before you can control it. Ignoring it is like trying to have a conversation in a loud room by just yelling. The smart move is to first understand the noise and then find a way to work with it. Now this is where it all comes together for beer flavour perception. We've established that pH only measures free hydrogen ions and that alkalinity fights against those pH changes. But here's the most critical piece of the puzzle. Your tongue doesn't taste pH. It tastes total acidity. Let's prove it with a simple but powerful example. Just ask yourself, what's the typical beer pH of a pale lager? It's usually around 4.2. And if you've made a kettle sour, the pH is going to sit at around 3.3 to 3.6. Now what about Coca-Cola? What's the pH of that? If you go and stick a pH meter in a glass of Coca-Cola, you'll get a reading of about 2.7 or so. Much, much lower than even the sourest of kettle sour beers. But is the Coca-Cola sour? Of course not. Sure, the Coke has a low pH because it has citric and phosphoric acids in it. But what it lacks is the buffering from phosphates because it's not a barley based beverage. So the pH will drop really hard, really fast. But that pale lager with the higher pH, it's actually more acidic than the Coca-Cola by about two to four times. How does that even make sense? You see, it's very common to have two beers with the exact same final beer pH, but have completely different flavors. One might be sharp and vibrant and crisp, and the other is soft, dull, and flabby. Your pH meter says they're identical, but your tongue says that they're worlds apart. This is because the total concentration of all acids is different, even though the pH is identical. This is the fundamental lie of the pH meter gives you when it comes to beer flavor. It gives you one data point, free hydrogen ions, and it pretends to be the whole story. But our perception of flavor is way more complex. What we call crispness and brightness is a direct result of the total quantity of acids, not the pH value. And to measure that, we need a different tool. So what's the fix? 
It's the number used by world-class brewers and winemakers to actually measure and control perceived acidity. It's called titratable acidity, or TA, and I want you to start thinking of it as the fourth crucial flavour number on your brewing dashboard and in your water profile. You probably think about a water profile for a beer as the parts per million of calcium and magnesium and sodium and sulfate and chloride, or maybe some historical city's water profile like Pilsen or Dortmund or Dublin. At the Rockstar Brewer Academy, we flip that concept on its head. A water profile is these three numbers for flavour. The first one is beer pH, for that general sense of brightness and crispness. The second one is the sulfate to chloride ratio. It steers the wheel in the direction of bitterness or maltiness. And the third one is the calcium concentration in parts per million, and that's for the minerality of the beer. But titratable acidity is the fourth beer flavour number. And when it comes to crispness, sourness and perceived complexity in beer, it's the most important one of all. So what is it? TA is a simple direct measure of the total amount of acid in your beer. Unlike pH, TA measures both the free and the bound hydrogen ions. It's not just the tip of the iceberg, it's the whole iceberg. Instead of a tricky logarithmic scale, TA is expressed in grams per litre of a particular acid. As brewers, we usually use lactic acid as our basis, but in winemaking, it's usually grams per litre of something like tartaric acid. This is amazing because the relationship between titratable acidity and perceived sourness is direct. A beer with a TA of 6 grams per litre will taste roughly twice as sour as one with 3 grams per litre. You just can't say that about pH. And I've seen this firsthand. There's a brewery here in Australia, and I won't name names, that once claimed to make Australia's sourest beer. Bold claim, right? The label proudly said the pH was below 3. So, I went to local bottle shop and I grabbed a can, I cracked it open, and holy hell, the stuff practically stripped the enamel off my teeth. So I grabbed my pH meter and I checked the pH myself, and it was sitting at 2.8. That's the same as Coca-Cola. But here's the thing. Coke isn't that sour. This beer was next level mouth puckering. So clearly pH wasn't telling the full story. So I decided to measure its titratable acidity. Now don't stress, I know titration sounds like high school chemistry trauma, but it's dead simple. You basically take a degassed beer sample and slowly add a known amount of a base like sodium hydroxide. Each drop neutralizes a bit of the acid until the pH hits 8.2 and that's your end point. From there, a quick calculation tells you how much acid was actually in the beer, and that's your TA. It's easy to do with basic gear, a pH meter, a burette, maybe a stir plate if you want to get fancy, something like that. You can set it up for less than $200. So let's come back to Australia's sourest beer, and how did it go? Well, a normal sour beer sits somewhere between 4 and 7 grams per litre of lactic acid equivalent. This thing, 22 grams per litre. No lactic acid bacteria on earth can make that much acid. It had to have been added straight into the bright tank. And honestly, that's not just bad brewing, that's a food safety issue. So the next time someone brags about their sour beer's pH, remember, the number might look cool on a label, but only titratable acidity tells the real story when it comes to directly measuring the sourness of a sour beer. Once you have this number, you have a powerful new target. You brew a crispy boy that has that perfect, crisp, refreshing finish, measure its TA. Let's say it's 2.5 grams per litre of lactic acid. That becomes your target. Next time, if the beer tastes a little dull and measures 2.1 grams per litre, you'll know why. You're no longer guessing based on a feeling or a misleading pH number. You have a hard, actionable data point that connects directly to the beer's flavour. This is pro-level stuff and I know it can be a lot, but if you want to go deeper and get step-by-step -step guidance on setting up quality control systems like this in your brewery, whether you're a home brewer, your planning brewery, or your brewery's already running, I've put together a free five-step beer quality checklist that you can download from the link in the description below. So let me show you how powerful titratable acidity can be with real-world data from a demo that I ran on a recent live coaching call with members of the Rockstar Brewer Academy. I tested three very different beverages. I tested Coke Zero, a local pale lager, and a commercial Berliner Weiss. Now first, the Coke Zero. 
As we said, its pH was low. The pH meter agreed, and it was sitting at about sort of 2.8, 2.9. And when I titrated it, the titratable acidity was sitting at around 2, 2.1 grams per litre. Next, the lager. Now, this is a beer that should be clean and crisp, but definitely not sour. The pH meter read 4.2, which is perfect for the style. Way less acidic than the Coke, right? But when I measured the TA, it was sitting at 2.6 grams per litre. Think about that for a second. The lager has a higher pH, but its total acid concentration is actually higher than Coca-Cola's. This is what gives a great lager that snappy, crisp finish. And then finally, the Berliner Weiss, a classic sour ale. Its pH was sitting at about 3.4. Now, interestingly, that's still higher than the Coke Zero's pH of 2.9. Based on pH alone, you'd expect that the Coke would be more acidic. But when I measured the TA, the real story came out. The Berliner Weiss had a massive TA of 7.7 grams per liter of lactic acid. That's more than three times the total acidity of the pale lager. This one comparison tells you everything you need to know, is that the pH numbers were misleading. The TA numbers lined up perfectly with the flavour. The lager's moderate TA gives it its crispness. The Berliner Weiss was a huge TA that gave it that signature sour punch. And TA, not pH, is the measure that reflects the acidic flavour that you actually taste on your tongue. So now, it's time to upgrade your water profiles for all the beers that you brew. Remember, there's a new way to define a water profile instead of the old historical city stuff or whatever beer smith or brew father or brewer's friend tells you to do. Instead, start tracking these four numbers together. The first number is beer pH. Keep using it for what it's for. Checking mash, conversion, monitoring fermentation, yeast health, and guiding the final flavor of the beer. Think of it as a process metric and not a specific flavor target. The second one is your sulfate to chloride ratio. Use this to balance your hop bitterness against the beer's maltiness. The higher the sulfate to chloride ratio, the more bitterness that you're going to perceive, which is great for that West Coast IPA. And the lower the sulfate to chloride ratio means that you're going to taste more malt, which is perfect for like a soft hazy IPA or a pale lager. The third is your calcium concentration in parts per million. You've got to track this for happy yeast, good flocculation, and a hint of mineral character in your finished beer if you want it. And the fourth one is titratable acidity. This is your new master control for beer flavor. Use it to dial in the exact levels of crispness, sharpness, and sourness that you want, no matter what style of beer you're brewing. This is the number that connects the lab data directly to what's in the glass and on your tongue. Titratable acidity is a great way to reverse engineer a beer recipe. Whenever you drink a commercial beer that tastes perfect, measure its TA and write it down. Then try to match it in your own brewery. When a batch you brew falls flat, for example, why don't you measure its TA and see how it's different? Over time, you'll build a library of targets for each of your beer styles that you like to brew, and it'll allow you to create that perfect pint with amazing consistency. Hey, if you like this video and you want to learn more about the system I use to brew world-class beer, I reckon you should check out this video next. Thanks heaps for watching this episode of Quality Focus Pro Brewers, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheers.